Sammy Robotham wrote, It is evident that in the great encircling oceans of the south, and the numerous islands and parts of continents which exist beyond that part of the earth where the sun is vertical, cannot have their days and nights, seasons, etc., precisely like those in the northern region. The north is a center, and the south is that center radiated or thrown out to a vast oceanic circumference, terminating in circular walls of ice, which form an impenetrable frozen barrier. Hence, the phenomena referred to as existing in the north must be considerably modified in the south. For instance, the north being central, the light of the sun advancing and receding gives long periods of alternate light and darkness at the actual center, but in the far south, the sun, even when moving in its outer path, can only throw its light to a certain distance, beyond which there must be perpetual darkness. No evidence exists of there being long periods of light and darkness regularly alternating, as in the north. In the north, in summertime, when the sun is moving in its inner path, the light shines continually for months together over the central region, and rapidly develops numerous forms of animal and vegetable life. In typical reverse-engineered, damage-control fashion, trying to explain away the midnight sun, problematic Arctic and Antarctic phenomena, and the fact that Polaris can be seen to 23.5 degrees south of the equator, desperate heliocentrists in the late 19th century again modified their theory to say the ball Earth actually tilts back 25.5 degrees on its vertical axis, thus explaining away many problems in one swoop. If it simply tilted the same direction constantly, however, this would still not explain the phenomena, because after six months of supposed orbital motion around the sun, any amount of tilt would be perfectly opposite, thus negating their alleged explanation for Arctic and Antarctic irregularities. To account for this, heliocentrists then added that the Earth also wobbles in a complex combination of patterns known as planetary nutation, the Chandler wobble, and axial precession, which, in their vivid imaginations, somehow explains away common sense. Common sense, however, says that if the heat of the sun travels 93 million miles to reach us, a small axial tilt and wobble, the difference of a few thousand miles, should be completely negligible. If the ball Earth actually spun around 93 million miles from the sun, regardless of any tilt or wobble, temperature and climate the whole world over should be almost completely uniform. If the heat of the sun truly traveled 93 million miles to reach the Earth's equator, the extra few thousand miles to the poles, regardless of any supposed tilt or wobble, no matter how extreme, would surely be negligible in negating such intense heat. E. S. Shini wrote, The supposition that the seasons are caused by the Earth's annual motion round the sun at a mean distance of 93 million miles is grotesque. According to Piazzi, the size of the sun is in proportion to the Earth as 329,360 to 1. The diameter exceeds that of the Earth 112 times. The Earth appears, as Bio says by this statement, a mere grain of sand as compared to the Sun. This enormous expanse of light, focused on a rotating grain of sand, at the distance of 93 millions of miles, would cause the same season throughout it. The paltry few miles in comparison that separates London from Cape Town could never cause diverse seasons, neither would the distance from London to the Riviera justify the difference in the climate that characterizes the two places. Common sense also says if the Earth were actually a ball spinning daily with uniform speed around the sun, there should be exactly twelve-hour days and twelve-hour nights everywhere, all year round, regardless of any alleged tilt or inclination, half the sphere would always be lit, and the other half not. The great variety and length of days and nights throughout the year all over Earth testifies to the fact we do not live on a spinning ball planet. There cannot exist phenomena such as this on a globe, nor the midnight sun, nor anything like Antarctic winter, where the sun is nowhere to be found for over two months per year. NASA and modern astronomy say the Earth is a giant globe spinning a thousand miles per hour around its central axis, traveling 67,000 mile per hour circles around the sun, spiraling 500,000 miles per hour around the Milky Way, while the entire galaxy rockets a ridiculous 670 million miles per hour through the universe, 
with all of these motions originating from an alleged Big Bang cosmogenic explosion 14 billion years ago. That's a grand total of 670,568,000 miles per hour in several different directions we're all supposedly speeding along at simultaneously. No one has ever seen, felt, heard, measured, or proven such motion, yet the vast majority of people unquestioningly accept that the clearly motionless earth beneath their feet is actually moving over 600 million miles per hour. NASA and modern astronomy say Polaris, the North Pole star, is somewhere between 323 and 434 light years, or about 2 quadrillion miles, away from us. Firstly, note that is between 1.9 quadrillion to 2.6 quadrillion miles, making a difference of over 600 trillion miles. If modern astronomy cannot even agree on the distance to stars within hundreds of trillions of miles, perhaps their science is flawed and their theory needs re-examining. However, even granting them their obscurely distant stars, heliocentric astronomers cannot adequately explain how Polaris manages to always remain perfectly aligned straight above the North Pole. If the globe Earth was really spinning west to east a thousand miles per hour, orbiting the sun counterclockwise at 67,000 miles per hour, spiraling around the outer arms of the Milky Way at 500,000 miles per hour, while shooting through the universe at 670 million miles per hour, how is it even conceptually possible that Polaris, two quadrillion miles away, day after day, year after year, always maintains its alignment straight above the North Pole. That would mean from two quadrillion miles away, Polaris would have to be perfectly mirroring Earth's several simultaneous wobbling, spinning, spiraling, and shooting motions. Polaris would have to be shooting the same direction through the universe at exactly 670 million miles per hour. It would have to be following the same 500,000 mile per hour, 225 million year spiral around the Milky Way, and mirroring the same 67,000 mile per hour, 365 day orbit around our sun. Or, the Earth is stationary, as common sense and everyday experience testifies. William Carpenter wrote, it is supposed in the regular course of the Newtonian theory that the Earth is in June about 190 million miles away from its position in December. Now since we can in middle north latitudes see the North Star on looking out of a window that faces it, and out of the very same corner of the very same pane of glass in the very same window all the year round, it is proof enough for any man in his senses that we have made no motion at all. Not only this, but viewed from a ball Earth, Polaris, situated almost straight over the North Pole, should not be visible anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere. For Polaris to be seen from the Southern Hemisphere of a globular Earth, the observer would have to be somehow looking through the globe, and miles of land and sea would have to be transparent. Polaris can be seen, however, up to approximately 23.5 degrees south latitude. Dr. Robotham wrote, if the Earth is a sphere and the pole star hangs over the northern axis, it would be impossible to see it for a single degree beyond the equator, or 90 degrees from the pole. The line of sight would become a tangent to the sphere, and consequently several thousand miles of and divergent from the direction of the pole star. Many cases, however, are on record of the north polar star being visible far beyond the equator, as far even as the Tropic of Capricorn. William Carpenter wrote, the astronomer's theory of a globular Earth necessitates the conclusion that if we travel south of the equator, to see the North Star is an impossibility. Yet it is well known that this star has been seen by navigators when they have been more than 20 degrees south of the equator. This fact, like hundreds of other facts, puts the theory to shame and gives us a proof that the Earth is not a globe. To account for this glaring problem in their model, Desperate heliocentrists since the late 19th century have claimed the ball Earth actually tilts a convenient 23.5 degrees back on its vertical axis. Even this brilliant revision to their theory cannot account for the visibility of many other constellations, though. For instance, Ursa Major, very close to Polaris, can be seen from 90 degrees north latitude, the North Pole, 
all the way down to 30 degrees south latitude. The constellation Vulpecula can be seen from 90 degrees north latitude all the way to 55 degrees south latitude. Taurus, Pisces, and Leo can be seen from 90 degrees north all the way to 65 degrees south. Aquarius and Libra can be seen from 65 degrees north to 90 degrees south. The constellation Virgo is visible from 80 degrees north down to 80 degrees south. And Orion can be seen from 85 degrees north all the way to 75 degrees south latitude. An observer on a ball Earth, regardless of any tilt or inclination, would not logically be able to see this far. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, Another thing is certain, that from within the equator, the North Pole star, and the constellations Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, and many others, can be seen from every meridian simultaneously, whereas in the south, from the equator, neither the so-called South Pole star nor the remarkable constellation of the Southern Cross can be seen simultaneously from every meridian, showing that all the constellations of the south, supposed pole star included, sweep over a great southern arc and across the meridian from their rise in the evening to their setting in the morning. But if the Earth is a globe, Sigma Octantis, the South Pole Star, and the Southern Cross, a Southern Circumpolar Constellation, they would all be visible at the same time from every longitude on the same latitude, as is the case with the Northern Pole Star and the Northern Circumpolar Constellations. Such, however, is not the case. Some heliocentrists have even tried to suggest that the pole star's gradual declination overhead as an observer travels southwards is proof of a globular Earth. Far from it, the declination of the pole star or any other object is simply a result of the law of perspective. The law of perspective dictates that the angle and height at which an object is seen diminishes the farther one recedes from the object until, at a certain point, the line of sight and the seemingly uprising surface of the Earth converges to a vanishing point, i.e. the horizon line, beyond which the object is invisible. Thomas Winship wrote, If we select a flat street a mile long containing a row of lamps, it will be noticed that from where we stand the lamps gradually decline to the ground, the last one being apparently quite on the ground. Take the lamp at the end of the street, and walk away from it a hundred yards, and it will appear to be much nearer to the ground than it was when we were close to it. Keep on walking away from it, and it will appear to be gradually depressed until it is last seen on the ground and then disappears. Now, according to the astronomers, the whole mile was only depressed about eight inches from one end to the other, so that this eight inches could not account for the enormous depression of the light as we recede from it. This proves that the depression of the pole star can and does take place in relation to a flat surface simply because we increase our distance from it, the same as from the street lamp. In other words, the farther away we get from any object above us, as a star for example, the more it is depressed, and if we go far enough it will sink or appear to sink to the horizon and then disappear. The writer has tried the street lamp many times with the same result. And Dr. Robotham wrote, it has often been urged that the Earth must be a globe because the stars in the southern hemisphere move round a south polar star in the same way that those of the north revolve around the northern pole star. This is another instance of the sacrifice of truth and denial of the evidence of our senses for the purpose of supporting a theory which is in every sense false and unnatural. It is known to every observer that the North Pole Star is the center of a number of constellations which move over the Earth in a circular direction. Those nearest to it, as the Great Bear, etc., are always visible in England during their whole 24 hours revolution. Those farther away southwards rise north-northeast and set south-southwest. Still further south, they rise east by north and set west by north. The farthest south visible from England, the rising is more to the east and southeast, and the setting to the west and southwest but all the stars visible from London rise and set in a way which is not compatible with the doctrine of rotundity. For instance, if we stand with our backs to the north, on the high land known as Arthur's Seat near Edinburgh, and note the stars in the zenith of our position, and watch for several hours, the zenith stars will gradually recede to the northwest. If we do the same on Woodhouse Moor, near Leeds, or on any of the mountain tops in Yorkshire or Derbyshire, the same phenomenon is observed. The same thing may be seen from the top of Primrose Hill near Regent's Park, London from Hampstead Heath or Shooter's Hill near Woolwich. If we remain all night, 
we shall observe the same stars rising toward our position from the northeast, showing that the path of all the stars between ourselves and the northern center move round the North Pole star as a common center of rotation, just as they must do over a plane such as the Earth is proved to be. It is undeniable that upon a globe, zenith stars would rise, pass overhead, and set in the plane of the observer's position. If now we carefully watch in the same way the zenith stars from the rock of Gibraltar, the very same phenomenon is observed. The same is also the case from the Cape of Good Hope, Sydney, and Melbourne in Australia, in New Zealand, in Rio de Janeiro, Montevideo, Valparaiso, and other places in the south. If then the zenith stars of all the places on the earth where special observations have been made rise from the morning horizon to the zenith of an observer and descend to the evening horizon, not in a plane of the position of such observer, but in an arc of a circle concentric with the northern center, the earth is thereby proved to be a plane and rotundity altogether disproved, shown indeed to be impossible. When you look up at the sun and moon, you see two equally sized, equidistant circles tracing similar paths at similar speeds around a flat, stationary Earth. The experts at NASA, however, claim your common sense, everyday experience is false on all counts. To begin with, they say the Earth is not flat, but a big ball. Not stationary, but spinning around 19 miles per second. They say the sun does not revolve around the earth as it appears, but earth revolves around the sun. The moon, on the other hand, does revolve around the earth, though not east to west as it appears, rather west to east. And the sun is actually 400 times larger than the moon and 400 times farther away. That's right. You can clearly see they are the same size and distance. You can see the earth is flat. You can feel the earth is stationary. But according to the gospel of modern astronomy, you are wrong and a simpleton worthy of endless ridicule if you dare to believe your own eyes and experience. With haughty arrogance, the nearest hypnotized heliocentrist will then inform you that the sun is 865,374 miles in diameter and 92,955,807 miles from the earth. The moon is 2,159 miles in diameter and 238,900 miles from the Earth. And those just happen to be the exact diameters and distances necessary for a viewer from Earth to falsely perceive them as being the same size. So you see, silly flat earther, it is all an illusion, and the apparent equanimity of our day and night luminaries in the sky results from mere coincidental parallax perspective. The sun does not revolve around the earth as it appears. Rather, the earth spins 1,038 miles per hour under your feet and revolves 67,108 miles per hour around the sun. The moon does indeed revolve around the earth, but not as it appears. Though it seems to move east to west, just like the sun and everything else in the heavens, the moon actually spins west to east at 10.3 miles per hour, while orbiting Earth at 2,288 miles per hour, which, combined with Earth's 1,038 mile per hour spin and 67,108 mile per hour orbit around the sun, coincidentally results in all motions perfectly cancelling out making the moon seem to move across the heavens with similar path and similar speed as the sun, while always only showing us one side of its surface and perpetually hiding its dark side. Bernard Brewer said, The moon presented a special math problem for the construction of the heliocentric model. The only way to make the moon fit in with the other assumptions was to reverse its direction from that of what everyone who has ever lived has seen it go. The math model couldn't just stop the moon like it did the sun, that wouldn't work, and it couldn't let it continue to go east to west as we see it go either, at the same speed or at a different speed. The only option was to reverse its observed east to west direction and change its speed from about 64,000 miles an hour to about 2,200 miles an hour. This reversal, along with the change in speed, were unavoidable assumptions that needed to be adopted if the model was to have any chance of mimicking reality. And Marshall Hall said, 
They want you to believe that the moon's rotation is perfectly synchronized with its orbit, so that's why we only ever see one side of the moon, rather than conclude the obvious, that the moon is simply not rotating. Moreover, they had to slow down the moon's speed by 58,870 miles per hour and reverse its direction to west to east to successfully sell their phony heliocentricity system to a gullible public. I don't think there is one person in many, many thousands, regardless of education, who knows that the Copernican model had to turn the moon's observable direction around and give it a new speed to accommodate the phases and eclipses. William Carpenter said, Astronomers tell us that the moon goes round the Earth in about 28 days. Well, we may see her making her journey around every day if we make use of our eyes, and these are about the best things we have to use. The moon falls behind in her daily motion as compared with that of the sun, to the extent of one revolution in the time specified. But that is not making a revolution. Failing to go as fast as other bodies go in one direction does not constitute a going round in the opposite one as the astronomers would have us believe. And since all this absurdity has been rendered necessary for no other purpose than to help other absurdities along, it is clear that the astronomers are on the wrong track. There are several theories about the relative size and distance of the sun and moon, all with their points of evidence and points of contention. Flat earthers throughout the ages have used sextants and plane trigonometry attempting to make such calculations, usually concluding the sun and moon both to be only about 32 miles in diameter and less than a few thousand miles from Earth. Perhaps the least plausible model, certainly the most exaggerated and imaginative, is the reigning heliocentric theory claiming the sun to be a whopping 865,374 miles in diameter, 92,955,807 miles from the Earth, and the moon 2,159 miles in diameter, 238,900 miles from the Earth. Heliocentrists' astronomical figures always sound perfectly precise, but they have historically been notorious for regularly and drastically changing them to suit their various models. For instance, in his time, Copernicus calculated the sun's distance from Earth to be 3,391,200 miles. The next century, Johannes Kepler decided it was actually 12,376,800 miles away. Isaac Newton once said, It matters not whether we reckon it 28 or 54 million miles distant, for either would do just as well. How scientific! Benjamin Martin calculated between 81 and 82 million miles. Thomas Dilworth claimed 93,726,900 miles. John Hines stated positively 95,298,260 miles. Benjamin Gould said more than 96 million miles. And Christian Meyer thought it was more than 104 million. Thomas Winship says, as the sun, according to science, may be anything from three to a hundred and four million miles away, there is plenty of space to choose from. It is like the showman and the child. You pay your money for various astronomical works, and you take your choice as to what distance you wish the sun to be. If you are a modest person, go in for a few millions. But if you wish to be very scientific, and to be mathematically certain of your figures, then I advise you to make your choice somewhere about a hundred millions. You will at least have plenty of space to retreat into, should the next calculation be against the figures of your choice. You can always add a few millions to keep up with the times, or take off as many as may be required to adjust the distance to the very latest accurate column of figures. Talk about ridicule. The whole of modern astronomy is like a farcical comedy, full of surprises. One never knows what monstrous or ludicrous absurdity may come forth next. You must not apply the ordinary rules of common sense to astronomical guesswork. No, the thing would fall to pieces if you did. Regiments of figures are paraded with all the learned jargon for which science is famous, but one might as well look at the changing clouds in the sky and seek for certainty there as to expect to get it from the propounders of modern astronomy. But there is no means of testing these ever-changing, never-stable speculations and bringing them to the scrutiny of hard logic and fact. Indeed there is. 
The distance of the sun can be measured with much precision, the same way as a tree or a house or a church steeple is measured, by plain triangulation. It is the principle on which a house is built, a table made, or a man of war constructed. The sun is always somewhere between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, a distance admitted to be less than 3,000 miles. How, then, can the sun, if it be so many thousands miles in diameter, squeeze itself into a space of about 3,000 miles only? But look at the distance, say the professors. We have already done that, and not one of the wise men we have so often challenged has ever attempted to refute the principle on which we measure the sun's distance. If the navigator neglects to apply the sun's semi-diameter to his observation at sea, he is sixteen nautical miles out in calculating the position his ship is in. A minute of arc on the sextant represents a nautical mile, and if the semi-diameter be sixteen miles, the diameter is of course thirty-two miles, and as measured by the sextant, the sun's diameter is thirty-two minutes of arc, that is, thirty-two nautical miles in diameter. Let him disprove this who can. If ever disproof is attempted, it will be a literary curiosity well worth framing. Measuring with sextants and calculating with plane trigonometry, both the sun and moon figure to be only about 32 miles in diameter and approximately 3,000 miles away. The moon is actually a semi-transparent luminary and not the solid spherical desert planet that NASA would have us believe. In fact, it is likely that both the sun and moon are not densely physical at all and are simply luminous flat disks able to pass by or through one another during eclipses. E. Eschini said, The results of recent research prove that the heavenly luminaries are not worlds, but lights, and should cause all men who have been led to accept as proven Copernicus's theory of the motions of the earth to reconsider this subject. Gabrielle Henriette said, the satellites of the Earth are not masses of matter. They are luminous and transparent disks without substance. The moon, in particular, conveys the impression of being an ethereal manifestation, and the uncertain and elusive character which is usually associated with this satellite results precisely from its immaterial nature. It was recognized from the earliest times that the satellites of the Earth, particularly the sun and the moon, were not solid, opaque bodies. They were first, until Aristotle, considered to be souls or spirits, which does not imply a physical nature. To the ancients, they were simply lights, and they gave the sun and the moon a very apt name. They called them luminaries. In the flat earth model, the sun and moon luminaries revolve around the earth once every 24 hours for the sun, and approximately 25 hours for the moon, illuminating like spotlights the areas over which they pass. The sun's annual journey from tropic to tropic, solstice to solstice, is what determines the length and character of days, nights, and seasons. This is why equatorial regions experience almost year-round summer and heat, while higher latitudes north and especially south experience more distinct seasons with harsh winters. The heliocentric model claims seasons change based on the ball Earth's alleged axial tilt and elliptical orbit around the sun. Their flawed current model even places us closest to the sun, 91,400,000 miles, in January, when it is actually winter, and farthest from the sun, 94,500,000 miles in July, when it's actually summer throughout much of the Earth. They say due to the ball Earth's tilt, different places receive different amounts of direct sunlight, and that is what produces the seasonal and temperature changes. This makes little sense, however. Because if the sun's heat travels over 90 million miles to reach the ball Earth, how could a slight tilt, a mere few thousand miles maximum, negate the sun's 90 million mile journey, giving us simultaneous tropical summers and Antarctic winters? Thomas Winship said, The Earth is a stretched out structure which diverges from the central north in all directions towards the south. The equator, being midway between the north center and the southern circumference, divides the course of the sun into north and south declination. The longest circle around the world, which the sun makes, is when it has reached its greatest southern declination. Gradually going northwards, the circle is contracted. In about three months after, the southern extremity of its path has been reached, the sun makes a circle around the equator. Still pursuing a northerly course as it goes round and above the world, in another three months, the greatest northern declination is reached. 
when the sun again begins to go towards the south. In north latitudes, when the sun is going north, it rises earlier each day, is higher at noon, and sets later, while in southern latitudes at the same time, the sun as a matter of course rises later, reaches a lesser altitude at noon, and sets earlier. In northern latitudes, during the southern summer, say from September to December, the sun rises later each day, is lower at noon, and sets earlier, while in the south, he rises earlier, reaches a higher altitude at noon, and sets later each day. This movement round the earth daily is the cause of the alternations of day and night, while his northerly and southerly courses produce the seasons. When the sun is south of the equator, it is summer in the south and winter in the north, and vice versa. The fact of the alternation of the seasons flatly contradicts the Newtonian delusion that the earth revolves in an orbit around the sun. It is said that summer is caused by the earth being nearest the sun, and winter by its being farthest from the sun. But if the reader will follow the argument in any textbook, he will see that, according to the theory, when the earth is nearest the sun, there must be summer in both northern and southern latitudes, and in like manner, when it is farthest from the sun, it must be winter all over the earth at the same time, because the whole of the globe earth would then be farthest from the sun. In short, it is impossible to account for the recurrence of seasons on the assumption that the earth is globular and that it revolves in an orbit around the sun. Gabriel Henriette said, The essential feature of the year is its division into two equal periods of six months, based first on the predominating length of the days over that of the nights, and vice versa, conditions which are governed by the varying hours of sunrise and sunset, and secondly, by the either high or low height reached by the sun in the heavens at midday. The first cycle, during which the days are longer than the nights, and the sun reaches its culminating point of the year, extends from the spring equinox to the autumn equinox, i.e. March 21st to September 22nd, and the second cycle during which, inversely, the duration of the nights exceeds that of the days, and the sun descends to its lowest point of the year, extends from the autumn equinox to the spring equinox, i.e. September 23rd to March 20th. These two six-month periods are also characterized by an opposition of temperature. During the first cycle, which corresponds to spring and summer, the heat gradually rises and falls, while during the second cycle, which comprises autumn and winter, it is the intensity of the cold which progressively increases and decreases. In the flat earth model, the sun and moon spotlights are perpetually hovering over and parallel to the surface of the earth. From our vantage point, due to the law of perspective, the day and night luminaries appear to rise up the eastern horizon, curve peaking high overhead, and then sink below the western horizon. They do not escape to the underside of the flat earth, as one might imagine, but rather rotate concentric clockwise circles around the circumference from tropic to tropic. The appearance of rising, peaking, and setting is due to the common law of perspective, where tall objects appear high overhead when nearby, but at a distance gradually lower towards the vanishing point. Samuel Robotham said, Although the sun is at all times above and parallel to the earth's surface, he appears to ascend the firmament from morning until noon, and to descend and sink below the horizon at evening. This arises from a simple and everywhere visible law of perspective. A flock of birds, when passing over a flat or marshy country, always appears to descend as it recedes, and if the flock is extensive, the first bird appears lower or nearer to the horizon than the last. The farthest light in a row of lamps appears the lowest, although each one has the same altitude. Bearing these phenomena in mind, it will easily be seen how the sun, although always parallel to the surface of the earth, must appear to ascend when approaching and descend after leaving the meridian or noonday position. What can be more common than the observation that, standing at one end of a long row of lamp posts, those nearest to us seem to be the highest, and those farthest away the lowest, whilst as we move along towards the opposite end of the series, those which we approach seem to get higher, and those we are leaving behind appear to gradually become lower. 
It is an ordinary effect of perspective for an object to appear lower and lower as the observer goes farther and farther away from it. Let anyone try the experiment of looking at a lighthouse, church spire, monument, gas lamp, or other elevated object from a distance of only a few yards and notice the angle at which it is observed. On going farther away, the angle under which it is seen will diminish, and the object will appear lower and lower as the distance of the observer increases, until, at a certain point, the line of sight to the object and the apparently uprising surface of the earth upon or over which it stands will converge to the angle which constitutes the vanishing point, or the horizon, beyond which it will be invisible. Heliocentrist would have you believe the very opposite of what every human who has ever walked the earth has seen with their own eyes. It is obvious to any child and sovereign-minded adult that the sun, moon, stars, and planets, every light in the sky above, revolves around the motionless earth beneath our feet. It is also plain to see that the sun and moon are both approximately the same size and situated relatively close to earth not four hundred times divergent and millions upon millions of miles away. To abandon your senses and everyday experience in favor of such unfounded science fiction fantasies is a fallacy of appeal to authority so extreme that it leaves the brainwashed believer impotent to trust his own natural instincts and forever thereafter chained to the fantastical explanations of astronomical charlatans. Thomas Winship said, no one ever yet felt or saw the earth careening through space at the terrific rates it is credited with, but everyone who is not blind can see the sun move. But the matter can be tested. It may be known for certain whether the sun moves or not. Take a school globe and place a style on the semicircle that holds it in position. Cause the globe to rotate against a lamp on a table, and you will find that the shadow left on the globe is always parallel to the equator, at whatever angle you may incline the globe. Further, let the style be of sufficient length to allow the shadow to fall on a flat surface, moving the globe towards the lamp, and the shadow will be a straight line. If, therefore, the shadow left on the earth by the sun be a straight line, then undoubtedly the sun is stationary. Drive a stake into the ground in such a position as to expose it to the sun for the greater part of a day, the whole day if possible. Mark the end of the shadow every quarter of an hour and you will find that the marks form part of an elongated curve clearly proving that the sun moves over a stationary earth. And David Ward Lascott said, The path of the sun is concentric, expanding and contracting daily for six months alternately. This is easily proved by fixing a rod, say, at noon on the 21st of December, so that on looking along it, the line of vision will touch the lower edge of the sun. This line of sight will continue for several days pretty much the same, but on the ninth or tenth day, it will be found that the rod will have to be moved considerably toward the zenith in order to touch the lower edge of the sun, and every day afterwards it will have to be raised till the 22nd of June. Then there will be a little change for a few days, as before, but day by day afterward the rod will have to be lowered till the 21st of December, when the sun is farthest from the northern center and it is dark there. This expansion and contraction of the sun's path continues every year and is termed the northern and southern declination, and should demonstrate to modern astronomers the absurdity of calling the world a planet, as it remains stationary while the sun continues circling round the heavens. In the heliocentric model, Earth is just one of eight planets in our solar system, all of which are said to be huge spherical Earth-like habitations or globular gas giants millions of miles away. They claim the Earth under our feet, along with these seven other planets, all revolve concentric circles or ellipses around the Sun, hence the term heliocentric. The previously prevailing geocentric model had placed Earth as the immovable center of the universe, with the sun, moon, stars, and planets all revolving around us, just as they appear. In the heliocentric model, however, which would be more appropriately titled the acentric model, the sun is only the center of our solar system, while itself, 
supposedly, simultaneously, revolving 500,000 mile per hour spirals around the Milky Way galaxy, which itself is constantly shooting 670 million miles per hour away from an alleged Big Bang creationary explosion at the beginning of time. In the geocentric model, the seven planets were known as wandering stars, with the multitude of other stars known as fixed stars. The wandering stars were so called because they can be seen meandering their own unique paths around the heavens, while all the other stars remain fixed in their steady group rotation around Polaris. The wandering stars also happen to be among the brightest in the night sky, and just as heliocentrists falsely claim the moon to be a mere reflector of the sun's light, they claim the bright starlight of these planets is merely them reflecting the sun's light back at us. This has already been shown to be geometrically impossible, however, as convex bodies do not and cannot reflect light in this way. In the heliocentric model, the wandering stars are all supposedly spherical Earth-like places several million miles away from us, while the fixed stars are all allegedly super-distant suns, similar to our own, but several trillion miles away, complete with their own solar systems and accompanying planets, perhaps even populated with sentient alien beings like ourselves. NASA's current official astronomical statistics state that there are upwards of 10 trillion such planets in our galaxy alone, and at least 200 billion galaxies in the universe. Therefore, they claim Earth is only one of one septillion planets in the universe. David Wardlaw Scott said, Our modern astronomers imagine the stars to be immense worlds or suns, some of them many thousands of times larger than our own, and at an enormous distance. Sir Robert Ball, in his Cause of an Ice Age, says of Sirius that it is a million times as distant from us as the sun, that it is ninety-two millions of millions of miles from the Earth. It is thought that stars are in a more or less advanced state of development, and that probably some of them may be already inhabited by beings suited to their spheres. Their distance from us they calculate to be so immense that, according to Sir William Herschel, the light from some of them will take a thousand years to reach this world of ours. Dr. Samuel Robotham said, Again, these stars are assumed to have positions so far from the Earth that the distance is almost inexpressible. Figures, indeed, may be arranged on paper, but in reading them no practical idea is conveyed to the mind. Many are said to be so distant that they should fall with the velocity of light, or above 160,000 miles in a second of time, 600 million miles per hour. They would require nearly 2 million years to reach the Earth. Sir William Herschel, in a paper on the power of telescopes to penetrate into space, affirms that with his powerful instruments he discovered brilliant luminaries so far from the Earth that the light which they emitted could not have been less than 1,900,000 years in its progress. Albert Smith said, The fixed stars are so called because, except for very long periods, they do not appreciably alter their relative positions, and they are mere points of light so small that the most powerful telescopes cannot magnify them into disks, yet they are supposed to be suns of immense size removed by the astronomers to immeasurable distance away from us for the credit and convenience of their theories. NASA even claims to have sent several remote-controlled flying telescopes, like the popular Hubble camera, into outer space, transmitting back to Earth pictorial proof of the validity of their model. These Hubble pictures show that the wandering stars are all in fact spherical Earth-like planets, just as the heliocentrists claimed all along. The Hubble pictures show that the fixed stars are also in fact distant suns, trillions of miles away, just as the heliocentrists claimed. The Hubble pictures and videos, all of which are indistinguishable from a good Photoshop or Hollywood production, completely confirm for hypnotized heliocentrists the truth of NASA's claims and the existence of various celestial phenomena which only NASA and their advanced cameras can show, like planets, galaxies, black holes, quasars, etc. 
Using even the most advanced non-NASA telescopes, however, the fixed and wandering stars appear to be nothing more than tiny dots of multicolored light. It cannot be ascertained whether fixed stars are actually distant suns, whether wandering stars are actually Earth-like planets, or whether any of NASA's claims hold any validity outside of their alleged pictorial evidence from these supposed remote control flying space telescope images. Outside of NASA, what evidence do we have that stars are actually distant solar systems? What evidence do we have that planets are Earth-like places in space? They are certainly interesting and plausible ideas, but there is absolutely no empirical evidence to support them. In fact, if NASA hadn't implanted such ideas into their heads, very few people would ever look up at the night sky and assume those little pinpricks of light were all Earth-like objects millions of miles away or suns trillions of miles away, complete with orbiting planets and moons just like ours. The only reason people believe wandering stars are Earth-like planets and fixed stars are distant suns is because of NASA propaganda. As Gabrielle Henriette said, the planets are not solid, opaque masses of matter as is believed. They are simply immaterial, luminous, and transparent disks. If stars are all distant planets or suns, how is it that various phenomena have been observed, including stars changing color, intensity of light, sudden appearance, disappearance, or shooting quickly from one place to another? I have watched single stars changing their colors as regularly as a disco ball, others shooting through the sky and disappearing, and stranger still, I once saw a star shoot quickly straight upwards through the sky for two seconds and then stop again. Back in the late 16th century, when the heliocentric theory was starting to take hold over the imaginations of an unsuspecting public, Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe famously argued for geocentricity, positing that if the Earth revolved in an orbit around the Sun, the change in relative position of the stars after six months of orbital motion could not fail to be seen. The stars should seem to separate as we approach and come together as we recede. In actual fact, however, after 190 million miles of supposed orbit around the Sun, not a single inch of parallax can be detected in the stars. Thomas Winship said, In the time of Tycho Brahe, it was said that the Earth revolved around the Sun, but he argued that if the Earth revolved around the Sun, the relative position of the stars would change very much, and the matter must, in the nature of the case, be easily detected. Accordingly, experiments were tried at intervals of six months, and the result showed that the stars were in exactly the same position as they had occupied six months before, thus proving that the Earth does not move at all. If the Earth is at a given point in space on, say, January 1st, and according to its present-day science at a distance of 190 million miles from that point six months afterwards, it follows that the relative position and directions of the stars will have greatly changed, however small the angle of parallax may be that this great change is nowhere apparent and has never been observed incontestably proves that the Earth is at rest, that it does not move in an orbit around the Sun. When Tycho Brahe demonstrated that after 190 million miles of supposed orbit around the Sun, not a single inch of parallax could be detected, heliocentrists, desperate to patch the glaring hole in their theory, pushed their hypothetical distances to the stars into the trillions of miles, claiming the closest one, Proxima Centauri, was a ludicrous 25 trillion miles away, and thereby making all the stars so conveniently far that no appreciable parallax could be detected. This expedient explanation, which heliocentrists have clung to ever since, has proven satisfactory to silence the manipulated minds of the masses, but still fails to adequately account for several issues. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, It is found by observation that the stars come to the meridian about four minutes earlier every 24 hours than the sun, taking the solar time as the standard. This makes 120 minutes every 30 days, and 24 hours in the year. Hence, all the constellations have passed before or in advance of the sun in that time. This is the simple fact as observed in nature, but the theory of rotundity and motion on axes and in an orbit has no place for it. Visible truth must be ignored because this theory stands in the way and prevents its votaries from understanding it. William Carpenter said, 
considerably more than a million Earths would be required to make up a body like the sun, the astronomers tell us, and more than 53,000 suns would be wanted to equal the cubic contents of the star Vega. And Vega is a small star, and there are countless millions of these stars, and it takes 30 million years for the light of some of those stars to reach us at 12 million miles in a minute. And, says Mr. Proctor, I think a moderate estimate of the age of the Earth would be 500 million years. Its weight, says the same individual, is 6 heptillion tons. Now, since no human being is able to comprehend these things, the giving of them to the world is an insult, an outrage. And though they have all risen from the one assumption that Earth is a planet, instead of upholding the assumption, they drag it down by the weight of their own absurdity and leave it lying in the dust, a proof that the Earth is not a globe. Several experiments have since been performed and repeated by notable scientists like Albert Mickelson, Edward Morley, George Airy, and George Sanyak, proving that it is the stars that revolve around a stationary Earth and not the other way around. The conclusive results of their experiments are not contested or even mentioned in modern astronomy books. Rather, they are conveniently swept under the carpet to keep prying minds from seeing through the lies. For example, the experiment known as Aries Failure, since it failed to prove heliocentricity, involved filling a telescope with water to slow the speed of light inside. Usually, telescopes must be slightly tilted to get starlight down the axis of the tube, supposedly due to Earth's speed around the sun. Aries discovered that actually the starlight was already coming in at the correct angle, so no change was necessary. This demonstrated that the stars move relative to a stationary Earth and not the other way around, because if it was the telescope moving, he would have to change the angle. Gabrielle Henriette said, All the planets, including the sun, revolve around the Earth. These circumstances cannot be denied since they are plainly visible, either in the ordinary way with the naked eye or with the help of the telescope. It can be said in this connection that in the case of a science which should be based exclusively on observation and not on speculation, such as astronomy, the evidence of the senses is the only factor upon which conclusions can and must be based. If the planets can be seen revolving around the Earth, it is for the decisive factor that they do revolve in such a way. It is asserted that this is not so, and it is maintained that the Earth and the planets revolve round the Sun. We note with astonishment, however, the bizarre and definitely suspicious fact that these planetary movements are not visible. They cannot be seen, and yet they are called real. How can these movements be proved and their speed be ascertained since they are invisible? On the other hand, the existing geocentric planetary motions which can be observed and measured and which consequently constitute a perfectly valid system are condemned as unreal and apparent. A pertinent remark may incidentally be made on the subject. Why do the astronomical tables which are published year after year give the so-called apparent movements of the planets in the zodiac? Why take the trouble of calculating and putting them on record at all if they are not real? Why is it also that no mention is made of the so-called real movements of the planets? Marshall Hall said, Trust your eyes and your cameras. They have no reason to deceive you about whether the stars are going around you nightly. Then get it in your mind, this single fact surrounding star trails that has been photographed thousands of times and cannot be denied must be explained away by the theoretical science establishment. All of the factless allegations, a rotating and orbiting Earth, billions of light-year distances to the stars, a 15-billion-year-old universe, the whole Big Bang paradigm, all of the alleged evolution of the universe, Earth, and mankind, that is to say, all of modern evolution-based cosmology controlling knowledge today, all of it, is completely undone if the stars are doing what cameras show they are doing namely, going around the Earth nightly. If you can do so for a few minutes, just lay aside the Copernican indoctrination that accompanies such pictures, and take a good hard look at these photographs of something that really, really happens every single night. Do you see what I see? I see all the visible stars in the northern skies going around the North Star in perfect circles. In other words, I see all the stars which these time exposures have recorded actually going around that navigational star that God put there for us in the northern hemisphere. Thomas Winship said, 
The plurality of worlds is based on assumptions so contrary to known possibilities that the grand idea must be thrown into the waste paper basket. The supposed great distance of the sun from the earth is the main cause of the delusions of the learned as to the so-called worlds above us being inhabited. This distance is based on a fictitious idea, that of the revolution of the earth round the sun, which I have already shown to be unconditionally false. The sun is a small body of light and near the earth, therefore all the star distances are wrong, their sizes and all other suppositions. The plurality of worlds is only the logical sequence of belief if the earth be a rapidly revolving globe, but this has been shown to be ridiculous in the extreme. Evidence, apart from any theory, has been presented which entirely nullifies such an assumption and renders it absurd, showing that such an unnatural idea has not a vestige of natural fact to support it. The grand doctrine of the plurality of worlds, therefore, like all of the other grand doctrines of modern astronomy, must be consigned to oblivion. When it can be shown that this world is a globe, and by what known principle the inhabitants can hang on to the swinging ball like the housefly crawls along the ceiling, it will be quite time enough to talk about the plurality of worlds. In other words, the plurality of worlds, if there's supposed to be many, many ball planets spinning around in this infinite universe, that only makes sense in the heliocentric spinning ball cosmology. It's been shown that the Earth is flat and motionless, so the idea that there are many other Earth-like planets out there, or there are many other ball habitations spinning around in the sky, is ridiculous. You can see with a telescope that the things that they call planets look exactly like the things that they call stars, and before they started calling them planets, they were called stars. They were called wandering stars. If the planets are supposed to be masses like Earth, why is it that their starlight is often brighter than the other stars, which they claim are suns? Why would they have light at all? It's the same like with the moon. They claim to land on the moon, and they show this desert planet, but we look up at the moon and see a shining light coming from this disk. If the moon is so bright shining with light like that, why weren't the astronauts constantly illuminated by this huge light that shines all the way 238,000 miles to the Earth. But then when they're on the moon, it's just dirt. When you look at these things through an actual telescope, they just look like disks of light. They don't look at all like suns or like ball planets. And when you take a good look at what NASA is feeding you, it's CGI. All the ball planets Every shot that NASA shows of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, did I miss any? All these things, all, all their pictures of these planets are clearly made on a computer. They are CGI, computer graphic images, computer generated images. So the idea that there are many other spinning ball planets out there in the sky is false. NASA doesn't do science. NASA does science fiction. Heliocentricity is not science. It's science fiction. Geocentricity is what you actually experience. It's what actually happens. The flat earth is what you actually experience. You do not experience a curve. You do not experience motion. You don't feel yourself moving thousand miles an hour. The stars don't change their relative positions. They're fixed because they're revolving around us just as it appears. Think about it. If we were revolving around the sun and the sun revolving around the galaxy and the galaxy revolving around the universe, guess what? All the stars would change their position every single night. You wouldn't be able to catch the same star trails two consecutive nights, let alone for hundreds and hundreds of years not changing positions. If you had those four different motions, everything spiraling around each other, you can't have the North Star fixed and all the other stars fixed in their constellations revolving perfect circles around it. Can't happen. You couldn't even have perfect circle star trails. They would be spirals. They would be awkward spirals. They would be like elliptical spirals. So, point is, Earth is not a planet. 
it's a plane. They just added a T to the end and fooled everyone. And then they started saying, there's one septillion other planets too, just like Earth. And then once they got people believing that, now they're saying, and there must be life on some of those. So there's aliens. And now they're preparing you for aliens. That's what's coming next. They want you to believe in aliens. They want you to believe that there's some off-world enemy or friend that's going to come here to save or destroy us, and they're going to use that as a false flag event to further their agenda. It's been in the works for a long time, so this is a big one. You could even say that this is the purpose of the Ball Earth Deception. What's the purpose? To create a world religion. What do you think NASA is? What do you think the spinning Ball Earth universe, Big Bang, evolution, bullshit is. It's a religion. People believe this shit and it doesn't exist. So, well, why did they lie about the flat earth, Eric? Because they're making you believe in a bullshit science fiction religion. That's why. You don't even know that you're in a cult. You don't know that you've been brainwashed and how deeply you've been brainwashed. You've been brainwashed so much that instead of thinking that you come from a intelligent consciousness, you think that you come from nothing and monkeys. They brainwash you to think that you and Earth aren't special or unique, but that there's just infinite Earths and worlds and beings, and humans are not the most intelligent of the intelligent designers' designs. They want you to believe that there's some aliens out there more intelligent. They want you to believe that they're more intelligent than you because only they have the Hubble Space Telescope and only they have all the technology necessary to tell you that oh stars are really suns and the wandering stars are, are planets and oh we found water on Mars with our little probe rover thing check out these CGI images we sent back on our million mile internet connection that we have but you don't and you've never seen anywhere think about how effective this religion is it's worldwide. It is a world religion. They have successfully created a worldwide religion and made people the whole world over believe in it. They teach it to them in government schools and they're so indoctrinated into this religion they have no idea that it's a religion. That's the point. They call it science. They have no idea that they're in a cult being brainwashed by a bunch of CGI pictures and fairy tales. So why the Flat Earth Deception? It's the most successful religious indoctrination in history. That's why. Around the turn of the 20th century, in order to save the dying heliocentric model from the conclusive experiments of Airy, Mickelson, Morley, Gale, Sagnac, Cantor, Nordmeyer, and others, Albert Einstein created his special theory of relativity a brilliant revision of heliocentrism, which in one philosophical swoop banished the universal ether from scientific study, replacing it with a form of relativism, which allowed for heliocentrism and geocentrism to hold equal merit. If there is no absolute etheric medium within which all things exist, then hypothetically one can postulate complete relativism with regard to the movement of two objects, such as the Earth and Sun. At the time, the Michelson-Morley and Michelson-Gale experiments had already long measured and proven the existence of the ether, but the church of heliocentrism was not to be deterred. Einstein never tried to refute the experiments scientifically, choosing instead to object philosophically with his notion of absolute relativity, claiming that all uniform motion is relative and there exists no absolute state of rest anywhere in the universe. Nowadays, just like the theory of heliocentrism, Einstein's theory of relativity is accepted worldwide as gospel truth, even though he himself admitted geocentrism is equally justifiable. Albert Einstein said, The struggle so violent in the early days of science between the views of Ptolemy and Copernicus would be quite meaningless. Either coordinate system could be used with equal justification. The two sentences, The sun is at rest and the earth moves, or the sun moves and the earth is at rest, would simply mean two different conventions concerning two different coordinate systems. George Ellis said, People need to be aware that there is a range of models that could explain the observations. 
For instance, I can construct you a spherically symmetrical universe with Earth at its center, and you cannot disprove it based on observations. You can only exclude it on philosophical grounds. In my view, there is absolutely nothing wrong in that. What I want to bring into the open is the fact that we are using philosophical criteria in choosing our models. A lot of cosmology tries to hide that. Einstein's necessary modification to the heliocentric theory ultimately resulted in transforming it into the eccentric theory of the universe, because the sun was no longer the center of anything, and all motion was only relative. Acentrists soon began postulating that not only is the Earth spinning a thousand miles per hour and revolving 67,000 miles per hour around the sun, but the Earth, sun, an entire solar system as a whole are simultaneously rotating around the Milky Way galaxy at 500,000 miles per hour. Furthermore, the entire galaxy with the Earth, Sun, and entire solar system are also simultaneously shooting 670 million miles per hour through the universe away from a Big Bang explosion at the beginning of time. E. Eschini said, The theory of the three, now four, motions of the Earth and subsequent relativity is the result of trying to cover up one lie by another. They say that as we whirl in London at the rate of nearly 11 miles a minute, we are shooting into space around the sun at nearly 20 miles a second, and the sun itself moves around a point in space at the immense speed of 150 million miles in a year, pulling our poor Earth with him at the added speed. The distance that separates us from the sun, and in this maddening whirlwind of motions, they try to apply Euclid's spherical trigonometry to locate distances which data was intended by Euclid to determine fixed points only, with the result that they have brought out wild calculations which have been fostered dogmatically on a gullible world, but are about as infallible as the utterances of Borgia. When Einstein first introduced his theory of relativity to the world, he often used the analogy of a wagon rolling along the street as an illustration. What we mean by relative motion he stated in a Princeton University lecture, in a general sense, is perfectly plain to everyone. If we think of a wagon moving along a street, we know that it is possible to speak of the wagon at rest and the street in motion just as well as it is to speak of the wagon in motion and the street at rest. That, however, is a very special part of the ideas involved in the principle of relativity. Gerard Hickson says, That would be amusing if we read it in a comic paper. But when Professor Einstein says it in a lecture at Princeton University, we are expected not to laugh. That is the only difference. It is silly, but I may not dismiss the matter with that remark, and so I will answer quite seriously that it is only possible for me to speak of the street moving while the wagon remains still, and to believe it when I cast away all the experience of a lifetime and am no longer able to understand the evidence of my senses which is insanity. Such self-deception as this is not reasoning, it is the negation of reason, which is the faculty of forming correct conclusions from things observed, judged by the light of experience. It is unworthy of our intelligence and a waste of our greatest gift, but that introduction serves very well to illustrate the kind of illusion that lies at the root of relativity. When he suggested that the street might be moving while the wagon with its wheels revolving was standing still, he was asking us to imagine that, in a similar manner, the earth we stand upon might be moving while the stars that pass in the night stand still. It is a case of appeal, where Einstein appeals in the name of a convicted Copernican astronomy against the judgment of Michelson, Morley, Nordemeyer, physics, fact, experience, observation, and reason. On the surface, relativity may seem plausible enough, especially when presented by a charismatic character of Einstein's caliber. But is it really so simple and straightforward? In fact, Einstein's theory of relativity is so complicated and convoluted that when it first came to the public's attention, it was said that there were probably less than a dozen people on Earth capable of understanding it. After Einstein presented his theory to the Royal Astronomical Society, philanthropist Eugene Higgins offered a prize of $5,000 for the best explanation of relativity in essay form, describing it so the general public could understand what it was all about. Prize winner Mr. L. Bolton himself admitted that 
even when stated in its simplest form, it remains a tough proposition. Along with Einstein's denial of the ether and anything absolute, except the absoluteness of relativity, he had to create a litany of new terms and ideas, each depending upon another and contributing to support the whole. For example, Einstein claimed that there was no ether, that time is a fourth spatial dimension, that infinity and eternity do not exist, and that light is a material thing. This meant that time must be added to the three dimensions of length, breadth, and thickness, that space be renamed a continuum, and points in the space-time continuum be renamed to events. Gerard Hickson said, What we have always known as a point in the terms of Euclid, Einstein calls an event. But if words have any meaning, a point and an event are two totally different things. For a point is a mark, a spot, or place, and is only concerned in the consideration of material things, while an event is an occurrence, it is something that happens. There is as much difference between them as there is between the sentence, this is a barrel of apples, and these apples came from New Zealand. While claiming time as a fourth dimension, Einstein explains that by dimension we must understand merely one of four independent quantities which locate an event in space. This is to imply that the other three dimensions which are in common use are independent quantities, which is not the case, for length, breadth, and thickness are essentially found in combination. They coexist in each and every physical thing so that they are related, hence they are not independent quantities. On the contrary, time is an independent quantity. It is independent of any one or all the three proportions of material things. It is not in any way related, and therefore cannot be used as a fourth dimension. Einstein's theory of relativity claims that light is a material thing which therefore has weight and is subject to gravity. This idea meant starlight could now bend under its own weight and curve its path based on the distance and mass of objects along with its trajectory, which allowed heliocentrists like Einstein to claim stars are in reality not where they appear to be, and that with his new geometry, the stars must be moved to much farther away than previously assumed. Einstein's Law of the Constancy of the Velocity of Light states that light always travels at the same speed, 186,414 miles per second, or 671,900,400 miles per hour. But Einstein also claims that gravity causes light to bend towards massive objects along its trajectory. If a ray of light can be said to bend, curve, or deviate from its course due to the gravitational pull of masses in its path, it must by necessity accelerate when approaching and decelerate when receding from these things. However, if light can bend under its own weight, or under the law of gravitation as Einstein claims it does, then it is not, and cannot be, absolute. Gerard Hickson says, Strangely enough, while Einstein claims that everything is in motion and nothing is stable, he allows one thing, and one thing only, to remain outside the realm of relativity, independent of everything else. He claims that the velocity of light is constant under all circumstances, and therefore is absolute. This is a blunder of the first magnitude, but I do not imagine that he fell into it through an oversight, for it is quite evident that he was driven into this false position. He was compelled to say that the velocity of light is constant, because if he did not, his new geometry would be useless. We are told that light is a material thing, and that a beam of light is deflected from a straight line by the gravitation of any and everything that lies near its course as it passes within their sphere of influence. And we are further assured that light always maintains a uniform speed of 186,414 miles per second. We have, however, to remind Professor Einstein that this was determined as the result of experiments by the physicists Fizeau, Foucault, Cornu, Michelson, and Newcomb, all of which experiments were conducted within the Earth's atmosphere, on terra firma. In all these experiments, a ray of light was reflected between two mirrors several miles apart, so that it had to pass to and fro, always through the atmosphere, and it is not to be supposed that light or anything else can travel at the same speed through the air as it would through the vacuum Einstein supposes space to be. Let us reverse this in order to realize it better. It is not to be supposed that any material thing travels at no greater speed through a vacuum than it does through air, which has a certain amount of density or opacity. 
If anything does not distinguish the difference between air and a vacuum, then it is not a material thing. It cannot be matter. On the other hand, anything that is matter must, of necessity, make such a distinction, and in that case, its velocity cannot be constant.